Hey, good morning. Again. You know what I think was one of the most frustrating things that you have to do? I think writing a resume is really frustrating. Just this week, Rodney stopped by my office and said, you should probably get to work on your resume. I didn't know what he meant by that, but I took his advice. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. But it's hard writing a resume, right? You've got to write down all the things that you've ever done that you feel like might be relevant to a position. And you have to say it in such a way that makes it attractive for people, right? There's a certain way you've got to write in a resume. You've got to talk about all the positions you've held, all the, all the skills that you have, all the maybe some goals that you've accomplished, things like that. But it's not just in writing for work, right? It's not just trying to get a job. It's hard to write a resume when you're, you're, you're out on a date with somebody, right? That's basically what it is. You, you, on a date, you're submitting resumes to each other. And somebody's like, I'm sorry, I would like to go with another candidate, please. Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to hire you. I do not want to work for you. Thank you. But you're also building a resume your whole life, even as a kid, right? How many of you were told, how many of you were told that something was going to go on your permanent record? Where is it? Who has it? I've never seen this permanent record. I'm waiting to get a speeding ticket and somebody being like, hey, by the way, this is your last offense. Why? Your permanent record. No. But you're told like, hey, you need to learn this skill for the next grade or you need to learn this, this you gotta learn to put these two numbers together for the next grade and then to get into a college, right? And then on and on and on it goes. Constantly building resumes, constantly trying to show our value and our worth to the people around us. It's subliminal. I'm doing it now. I had my, uh, my waiter boot in the baptistry leaked, so now I don't have socks on. And I'm worried you guys are going to see that and be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with this guy? I don't wear socks. Constantly, subliminally building resumes towards people. Hoping you'll accept me. Hoping I'll accept you. It's exhausting. And I want to talk today as we look at the fifth of Jesus' six trials in this series on the trials of Jesus, the court cases of Jesus. I want to talk about how Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected to set us free from all the resume building that we do, to give us a break. We're going to be in Luke chapter 23, verses 6 to 12, just 6 to 12. And I want us to see three things that we try to put on a resume that don't actually give us our value. Three things that don't give us our value. The first is you are worth more than your position. You're worth more than your position. Verse 6 of chapter 23. When Pilate heard this, so when he heard that Jesus was from Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And we learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction. He sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. All right, so who's this Herod guy? Herod His birth name is Antipas, Antipas. He is the son, one of the younger sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the guy who in the Christmas story is sending the wise men, is trying to to get them to reveal where Jesus' location is. He kills all the the small children. And Herod the Great uh, is is really just an awful guy. And he seems, it seems to be genetic because he passes it on to his kids. And so what happens is when Herod dies, his will splits his kingdom between his three sons, three of his sons, the ones that he's left alive. One is named Archelaus, and he gets Judea. Archelaus chooses, uh, tr- proves to not be very good at his job. He's fired, and that's when the Roman governors start ruling over Judea, culminating with Pilate uh, in our story today. Antipas is another one, and he eventually, he gets Galilee in another region. And after the deposal of his brother Archelaus, the name Herod becomes this like dynastic title. So if you were called Herod, it's not your name, it's more of like uh, you're the chief of the family, right? So the reason why he's called Herod in this passage is not to confuse us, but to show that he's the top dog in the, in the Herod family. His birth name is Antipas. He's not a king, not like his father was. He's what's called a tetrarch, which is a lesser title, kind of like a duke or a, or a count or something like that. And I want you to think about this picture. Herod's in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. Actually, he's probably just there to make sure everything goes okay. 
And he finds out that Jesus is gonna, gonna come see him. And I want you to think about Jesus for a second. Who is Herod? Herod's, the thing that he's most well known for is he killed John the Baptist. And he killed John the Baptist because John was calling him out over an incestuous relationship that, was, that he was having with his brother's ex-wife. Herodias divorced Herod's brother and then married him. According to Levitical law, in Leviticus 18, 16, and 20, 21, it was illegal for you to marry your brother's wife after a divorce. Should also have bothered somebody that she's his niece, but apparently that didn't make the cut as things to be concerned about. It was a very different time back then. And so he has John executed. And he doesn't execute him because he's a threat to him politically. He doesn't ar uh, arrest him and execute him because he's talking about how terrible of a ruler here it is. He's arresting him because he's insecure. I don't like what you're saying about me. It hurts my feelings. It makes me sad. So I'm going to use my power to stop you from saying bad things about me. He's insecure in his position. He killed John because he's a threat to his prestige and his position. And here Jesus is about to stand in front of the man that did this. Now think about that. If that was us, somebody, we're about to go stand before the guy that murdered our cousin, murdered a family member, and now seems to have it in for me too. We would be both simultaneously scared to death, knowing what this man is capable of, while at the same time being so angry and wanting to do the same thing back to this guy. If I could just get my hands around him. And on the surface of things, Herod is the picture of security. He's in charge. Jesus is in the palm of his hands. He can do whatever he wants, and Jesus seems to be powerless. He's in chains. He's not even defending himself. Everybody's abandoned him. But behind the scenes, underneath the surface, the roles are completely reversed. Everything about Herod screams insecurity. When you read more about him, you realize that he was an incredibly insecure man-child that never grew up. And Jesus, on the other hand, is the Son of God. He's supremely powerful. He's in control. He's in charge. And he's in control of everything that's happening. His actions show nothing but security. And sometimes our positions much like Herod's positions, can affect us just like they affected Herod. We spend a lot of effort getting the roles and the titles we want, right? Getting into positions that we want to be in. CEO, maybe middle management, just getting a promotion, getting a spouse, having children, gaining those titles, those accolades, getting that position. We spend a lot of energy doing that, and we think that once I get there, I'm going to be happy. Once I get to that point, I'm going to feel more stable and more secure. But it seems that the opposite is true. It seems I become more vulnerable the more things I gain, not less. Because you have something to lose now. Something can be taken from you. If you're a parent, you worry about your kids all the time. Like 25% of my brain power that I didn't even know I had is just hanging out with Hattie and Sophie wherever they're at. Are they okay? I hope they're being nice to people. Somebody comes up to me and they're like, I've got a Hattie story for you. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> if you become rich, you're worried about losing your money. If you get a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you're worried about losing them. Even if you're in school, you're a kid. You're like, well, I'm not gaining anything. Yeah, well, guess what? You got a test on Friday. And if you do well on that one, guess what you're going to have to do again? Prove yourself again on the next test and the next test and the next one. Collecting trophies and significance does not make you secure. It makes you less secure. It exposes the tragedy of losing things, losing what you loved. John Steinbeck says, it is so much darker when a light goes out than it would have been if the light had never shown. So what? Travis, am I supposed to be a monk now? Am I supposed to just become ascetic and go live out in the wilds of somewhere and, and just get rid of everything, sell it all, give it away? Maybe, for some of us. I think that could be a viable option. But for most of us, no. Most of us, the problem is not the position. 
The problem is that you want to occupy the position alone. You're not satisfied, just like Herod was not satisfied with the title of Tetrarch. You know how Herod finally gets fired? His wife, Herodias, and niece, sends him to Rome and says, it's not right that you're not king. You need to go to Rome and tell the emperor you want to be king. You don't want to be Tetrarch anymore. And the emperor says, great, I don't want you to be Tetrarch anymore either. And he gets exiled to Gaul for the rest of his life. And Herodias goes with him. We're not satisfied with the title of CEO. We're not satisfied with the title of parent or friend or spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, graduate. We want to be the king. We want the glory and the honor and the sole possession of being a king. And again, we have to turn to this man in chains standing before this insignificant ruler. And you know how we know he's insignificant? Because before we started talking about him, most of us in this room, myself included, couldn't have told you a meaningful difference between Herod the Great and Herod Antipas. He's insignificant. Jesus is the only one in these proceedings, in all these trials, Herod, Pilate, the Sanhedrin, who is completely secure. Everybody else is freaking out. They're losing their minds. And Jesus is just calmly riding the wave, watching it go, in control. You know why? Because he's secure. He doesn't find his value and his worth from his position, largely because his position is unassailable. He's trusting the Father. He's resting. You see, the difference between people who are secure in their position and they're insecure in their position, you know what it is? The inability to rest is the insecure person. If you feel like you have to constantly justify yourself in your position, if you feel like you have to constantly remind people of the resume, and you gotta keep adding to the resume, and you gotta keep reminding people why they need you, you can't take a break or somebody else will get ahead of you. You gotta keep working, you gotta keep going, or somebody else is gonna get, get ahead of you, get in front of you, or you're gonna lose the status that you've gained. Guess what? You're not secure. If you can't rest, you're not secure. Psalm 46.10 tells us, be still and know that I am God. That is, that is what resting is. It's being still and knowing that God is supremely in charge and in control. So if we know that's what it is, why is it so blasted hard to do it? Why is it so hard? I'm going to tell you how to apply this. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to rest. I want you to be still and know that he is God for one day a week. Sorry, one hour a day, one day a week, one week a year. And a lot of you will get to tomorrow and you're going to try it. You're going to try Monday morning. You're going to try to do an hour a day and you're going to be like, what are we doing here? Am I just supposed to sit here? What is this? I'll tell you why a little bit later. But I get that it's difficult. It's difficult to put off your position, stop deriving your importance from what you do, even for an hour. So I want you to try something. I do this personally. My counselor recommended this to me. I have two coupons sitting on my desk. It says 10 minute break on them. And I cash in those coupons mostly every day. Come back from a long string of meetings or work on a sermon, maybe finish, get to a certain point on it and say, you know what, I'm gonna take a break. And I take one of my little 10 minute coupons and I put them in the desk drawer and I quietly rest. Remember what Christ has done for me. Sometimes I look and see what the Braves are doing so I don't rest perfectly. But I want you to do that. I want you to make concrete evidence. Now, here's the other thing. I know how we are. Some of you are going to get to the end of the day and be like, I didn't even need the 10-minute breaks. Fail. Fail, fail, fail. Use them. Also, they don't accrue. So we also do this with our rest. We save it and let it roll over, right? The 10-minute break coupons do not roll over. You can't save them up and use them again the next day. You can't build them up and have a day off. Your employer will not recognize the 10 minute break coupon that one of your pastors told you to use. It's non-legal tender. If they do, tell me, I'd like to use it too. Our position is one of the things that we submit on our resume of life and think that we have value. But there's something else we like to talk about too. We like to tell people what our skill set is, what we have to offer. This is what I can bring to the table, but you are worth more than what you offer. Verse eight, 
Verse 8, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer, and the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. We find out that Herod has wanted to see Jesus for a very long time. We find out uh, earlier in the gospel that when uh, Jesus uh, shows up on the scene and Herod gets wind of him, he thinks that it's it's John the Baptist resurrected. Now, this probably isn't literal. It's probably a a, a kind of an exasperated thing. Like, Herod's like, I just killed one of these guys. Is there another one? Like, how many more of these people do I have to kill before they'll leave me alone? Even the Pharisees at one point, I think in our dwell readings this week in Luke 13, they come up to Jesus, the Pharisees of all people, and they're like, hey, you need to get out of here. Herod's trying to kill you. And Jesus claps back. This is awesome. He's like, you go tell that fox, basically, I'll leave when I want to leave. He's wanted to see him for a long time. And now that he has him in his clutches, you know what he wants from him? Show me what you got. Let's see some cool thing that you can do. Here's some fish. Make it more fish. Do something. I've got this guy in in jail right now that's just out of his mind. See if you can make him well. He's there to be entertained. We know that Herod likes to be entertained. The reason why he kills John is because he has a stepdaughter with Herodias, and he wants his stepdaughter to dance for him, and she doesn't want to. And he says, well, I mean, he makes an oath. He says, I'll give you half my kingdom if you do, up to half my kingdom. And she goes to her mom. She says, Mom, what should I ask for? And she says, the head of John the Baptist, because she hates John the Baptist. Can you imagine telling your teenage daughter to dance for the life of a man? And she does. And they kill him because Herod is insecure, right? He wants to not be embarrassed in front of his guests. But he loves to be entertained. And so here we have the impression that I get of Herod is people exist in one of two categories for him. Either A, You were there for him. You were there to entertain him. You were there to add value to his life. Or B, you are a threat to him. You expose his vulnerabilities and you're somebody that's supposed to be gotten rid of. And Jesus exists in the threatening category right now. And Herod thinks he has total power of him. And he's basically saying to Jesus, look, I can kill you or you can show me that you're valuable to me. So do some tricks. Maybe I'll let you be imprisoned like your cousin And you can come out every once in a while and during a party, maybe a birthday party we'll bring you out. We'll uh, we'll hit a pinata and then you can make two birthday cakes into four birthday cakes. And Jesus isn't biting. He's not taking any of it. Jesus doesn't care. There's a lot of Herods out there in the world that just like Herod's not his birth name, Herod may not be their birth name, but it's the title they carry because that's exactly how they view the world. You're either here for me to help me or you're in my way. And they treat everybody just like that. They evaluate everybody just like that. You grade everybody. Everybody's value is ascribed to how much they can add to you or how much they can take away from you. And if you're the object of that, and I'm pretty sure everybody in our life has been at some point, if you're the object of a bully, who judges you based on what you can add to them or detract from them, can I just offer up something to you? You're worth more than that. You are worth more than somebody's opinion of you. Maybe you're the put upon, the disregarded, the abused. Maybe you don't feel like you can do anything right. You are so much more than what you can offer to the Herods of the world. Just because you don't line up and measure up to their grading system Well, who put them in charge? You're not their playthings. You are made in the image of God. Somebody that God finds supremely valuable. And that's why Jesus is on the floor in there, in that palace, in chains, being ridiculed. Because he wants you to know how valuable you are. You are so valuable to the Father that he would send his son of supreme value, of the utmost value, to rescue people from the chains of the Herods of the world. He wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt that the the creator of the universe, the king of kings, finds you desirable. And here's the great thing. Guess what? You can't offer Jesus anything. 
You have nothing to give him. You know why? It's a pretty hard, it's a pretty core theological principle that we believe about Yahweh, and it's this, that he's independent. What that means is he doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't need anything outside of himself to exist. You can't give God anything he needs because he doesn't need anything. It really puts a ding in the resume. In fact, the one thing we do have to offer God is our sin, our failures, our shortcomings. And Jesus died to break those chains as well, to set us free from our sins, to set free from the emptiness and brokenness that sin has placed on us. If you will just trust him, if you will just trust him when you come to him without anything to offer, he's not going to slap you down. He's not going to be mad at you. If you just trust him to come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I don't have anything to offer you but my failures. And he says, that's exactly why I came. Here's the key to the lock. And if Jesus died to set us free from those chains, why would we let any Herod that we ever meet put those chains back on us? Why would you do that? Thaxton and Margaret Elizabeth in their baptism were making a profession of faith that they will devote themselves to making sure that the king rules their lives and that people will not put chains on them. Now, if you're a Herod, if you're somebody in the world who maybe does view the world through value added or value subtracted, I have something to say to you too. There's a lot of scholars that talk about this passage in Luke. Luke's the only one who brings up the trial of Herod. And it's really funny because a lot of scholars are like, why is this in here? We started out at Pontius Pilate's house, now we're back at Pontius Pilate's house, and the story is not advanced at all. In fact, Harold Honer, who's one of my professors back at DTS, he's since passed, he says this in his book on Herod Antipas. He says, Herod is brought into the trial, but adds nothing to the progress of the trial. And for those of us who are Herods, who operate not just once or twice, but live your life evaluating people on what they can or cannot give to you, Eternity will have this to say as an epitaph. They came into the world, but they added nothing to the progress of it. The people who have to be entertained, served, coddled, are frequently the ones who add the least to the society around them, to the human people. And the sad thing is, many of us in that position, and we've all been there, think Jesus can add very little to our lives too. We are like Herod. We look at that man in chains and we think, "Ah, I can't add that much to me. He can't do that much for me. And you know what happens then? If you do not know how to accurately evaluate the creator of all things, you don't know how to accurately evaluate anybody else. And it's not until, so you can't judge anybody because you're not accurately judging the creator. Therefore, you don't know what people can add or subtract to your life. On the other hand, when you come to know Christ, when you repent of that, when when Christ comes into your life and changes you, guess what happens? You realize you don't have a right to judge anybody else because we're all broken and in need of a Savior. That's why judgment is precluded. It's not too late for you. I know that I sound pretty harsh right now, but it is not too late for you, my Herods of the world. If Herod had just gotten off the throne and come down there and knelt before the the king in chains and said, I'm so sorry, I am just a lowly tetrarch and you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus would have embraced him and forgiven him. All you have to do is confess. All you have to do is show him that you are sorry for what you have done. Admit that you are in chains. Admit that you don't have anything to offer him. And that his cross gives you all that you need to offer anybody else. One of the other things we like to put on our resume is we like to talk about goals. We like to talk about things that we have accomplished or will accomplish. And I want you to close by saying that we are worth more than our agenda. We are worth more than our agenda. Look at verse 10 and verse 12. Verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. So Herod sends Pilate a gift. He sends him Jesus back with a not guilty verdict and an interesting epitaph on the story. The reason why he says this, the reason why he says that they're friends now, the reason why they were at at, at odds with each other is because they were peers. They're rivals with each other. Herod wants what Pilate has. He wants control over Judea too. He wants to get that throne, the kingdom, the whole thing that his father had. On the other hand, Pilate has murdered several Galileans 
in a story earlier in the Gospel of Luke. And so Herod has rivalry issues here, and Pilate doesn't really care for him either. They're enemies. And look what happens in verse 10 and verse 12. You see the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders are brought into it. And you see these religious leaders, they don't like Pilate, and they don't like Herod too much either. And then you go to Pilate, who historically doesn't like the religious leaders, and he doesn't like Herod. And then you go to Herod, who doesn't like the religious leaders, and he doesn't like Pilate. It's like this Mexican standoff, right? And in the middle of it comes Jesus. And all of their attention, all of their focus, they realize their agenda can be accomplished if we can get rid of this guy. Let's take a minute, let's put our guns down against each other, and let's put them towards this one Jewish rabbi. All their agendas are wrong. And you know why their agendas are wrong? Sure, I know, they're, they're, they're out to kill Jesus, yes. But it's why they want to kill him. They think that their personal, earthly agenda can be accomplished by the elimination of this man. In Mark 8, 15, Jesus tells his disciples, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Now, those are not similar groups. The Pharisees are religious zealots. They are, they are legalistic, they believe in following the law, and they are very, very devoted to Yahweh. Herod, on the other hand, couldn't care less. He dabbles in Judaism, but he also dabbles in Hellenism and all sorts of stuff. But both of them believe that God's will for them is political power on earth. The Pharisees believe that a Messiah will show up, set up an earthly kingdom that will repel Rome. Herod, on the other hand, believes that the more power and authority he gains, the better off he is and the better off everybody else is. They both believe that power and influence, earthly power and influence, is God's will. And I hope you see your own agenda exposed. Because many of us believe that if we get the right person in office, if we get the right law put in place, then God's will will be accomplished and we can be excited. Do not trust the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Now a lot of us, we... we go to agendas, political agendas, that's what we think of. But we also have our own small little agendas, and these are perhaps more insidious than we realize. How many of you get a little flutter in your stomach when you get to cross something off a to-do list? I had one brave soul in the first service actually raise her hand. I'm so proud of her. I'd like to think then she went and crossed a law. She was like raised hand in church. (laughs) Drop the kids off at school, get to work, pick up groceries, work out. Hang that picture that she's been asking me to hang for a while. That's me. I don't know if you have that, but I have that. Boom, boom, boom. Accomplishing tasks, accomplishing missions. We think that as long as we're getting stuff done, we have significance. Look at all the things I've done. Look at my accomplished agenda. I'm important. We make a fatal mistake, and you know what it is? We confuse having an agenda with having a purpose. Having an agenda without a purpose is like an engine without a car. It's like a drum without any sort of talent. It's just noise. And the reason why we can't sit and take a 10 minute break in the middle of the day to reflect and to be still and know that he is God, you know why? Is because when the agenda train stops moving, we're left to sit and think about the fact that, man, what am I doing here? I'm just moving, I'm just going, I'm just blowing and going, it's gonna be great. And then when you stop and slow down, you realize, I don't have a reason for doing this other than just to keep going. Because when the silence hits, and the lack of activity hits, whether it's when you lay down to go to bed at night or whenever it is, you're left with a five second window without your phone, you're forced to think about the fact that, you know what? I don't know my purpose. I don't know meaning. I don't know what's significant. But the good news is, you can get purpose from a man who's in chains in this story. He's the only one that can set you free from your agendas. He's the only one who can give you purpose. He's the only one who can give you meaning because he created you. You are so much more than the accomplishment of tasks. So much more than that. He gives us life. Remember what he says in John. He came to give us life and to give us abundant life, to give us flourishing. Flourishing is not an agenda. It's not the accomplishment of tasks. He died to set us free from the self-justification that comes from our agendas. We don't think, I think, therefore I am. We believe I do, therefore I am. And what many of us do, we make the, the cardinal sin 
of submitting our resumes, of our positions and our offerings and our agendas to God and saying, look at all that I'm doing for you, God. I'm a deacon. I'm a connect group leader. I'm, I'm a pastor. Look at, look at all the, I, I went to church this Sunday. I'm, I'm planning on going on a mission trip. Look at all that I'm doing for you, God. And God looks at us the same way that some employers have looked at us and said, I'm sorry, we're not hiring for those who need self-justification in the kingdom right now. Application denied. It'll never be good enough. Your resume will never be accepted. You know why? Because he already filled the position with a perfect sacrifice. The position of king has already been filled with Jesus Christ. And he wants you to be there with him. He wants to hire you. Jesus is now in charge of hiring. And the only requirement on the resume, the only prereq you need is to admit your need for him. To admit that you can't do it. To admit your resume is blank. That you are immensely unqualified for the position of child of God. But you'd really like to learn. And Jesus says, that's exactly why I died. Give your life to me. And so now, guess what? Jesus wants to write you a position title. He wants to write you a job description. If you've given your life to Christ, if you have put your faith and hope in his death, his burial and resurrection, you have a post-it note in your bulletin. And you get to write a one-word job description that Jesus has given you. Because of Jesus, I am now accepted. Or because of Jesus, I am now free. And I'm supposed to live that way. Or because of Jesus, I have been forgiven. And what we're going to do to close this service you're going to have a moment to write what, you've, what, what your word is, and then we're going to bring it up here to the board, and we're going to stick it up on the board, just like Rodney talked about. If you, uh, if you have trouble getting down, if you're in the, the balcony, there will be uh, deacons and, and others who are here to pick them up for you. If you need help, just put them up in the air. If you don't have a post-it note, you didn't get a bulletin, put your hand up in the air. Somebody will bring it to you. And then return to your seats, and we'll close the service together. But brothers and sisters... You are worth more than your resume. You are worth much more than your resume. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift that we can be brought on board to your team. We're hired if we'll just ask to join. If we'll ask for the Savior to forgive us and bring us on board. Lord God, may those who are in this room realize the great gift and opportunity that the greatest, op- the greatest role they will ever get to play was just child of God today. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray.